Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us at our CPE 2AL speaker series. Today we have Dr. Richard Branham, professor and researcher at the University of Alabama, focusing on space propulsion. Without further ado, off to you, Rich. Nice to see everybody today. I, um, I was asked to talk to you guys about some of this space propulsion stuff. What I wanted to talk to you about was some of the research that we're doing here. Uh, for the space propulsion stuff, but I wanted to kind of start with where we are kind of with how our low temperature plasmas is, is doing, how we're using it to apply it in, in these space propulsion things and how it enables these missions. The, um, the important thing, I mean, space propulsion has been around for a little bit. We've been doing plasma stuff for a while. The, the important research that we're doing now is, is really to focus on the high efficiency and maybe try to find some new and innovative ways to apply some of this stuff. So a lot of engineering type research, uh, and and that's that's where I, that's what I do. That's what I'd like to do. So I enjoy that kind of thing. I want to show you um, real quick why we want to even worry about using space propulsion and the electric propulsion stuff. The um, electric propulsion kind of breaks the bonds of what we get from chemical rockets. Chemical systems and thermal rockets um, are somewhat limited in how much energy that they can put into the propellant that we're using. But, but they have, um, the, their advantage of course is that they do very high thrust. Electric propulsion isn't limited by the thermodynamics. Once we apply, uh, once we make a charged solution somehow with low temperature plasma, we can then uh, um, electrostatically and magnetically accelerate that here at the bottom of the slide. We go from Newton's law to Lorenz's law in the, in the forces that we know about from gravitational forces to to exchanging momentum using the Lorentz forces, the electric and the magnetic forces. The, um, just as a relative, you can see that the typical temperatures for thermal is in the order of 2,500 to 3,500 and, and plasma temperatures start at like 10,000 and go up from there. So we can get to these higher temperatures. And what that means is here at the top is that we have much, much better propellant utilization. Specific impulse is what we use to characterize that. It's kind of like our miles per gallon statistic that we use for um, propulsion. And the higher that we get the temperature, the, the um, higher the exit velocity, the higher the specific impulse. So the less propellant we need to do the same amount of work or same amount of momentum exchange, but the, the electric propulsion systems come somewhat limited in their abilities. So for this talk, I mean, there's lots of different things going on with these things and lots of different things going on in the research. I wanted to focus more on what we were able to get into here at the University of Alabama. The, um, three classes, and, and I got the third one here, but we really only work with the two classes. The three classes we have um, in electric propulsion is thermal, that's the um, arc jets and resisto jets, bottom left corner, the electromagnetic, or I'm sorry, the electrostatic, which is the bottom right one that you see here, the ion thruster that NASA has developed over the years, and the electromagnetic ones. And, and the hull thruster is kind of the one in between the static and magnetic, where um, there are thrusters like the magneto hydrodynamic thrusters that are completely magnetic, but the Hall thruster is the one that we focused on and it uses both the electric forces and the magnetic forces to do what it does. Um, so the important critical things that we wanna focus on, let's see. For us, our areas of interest, well, um, inside the thruster, right? We wanna know how to make this thing work better. So we need to know what it's doing. And, and we've always had a problem with measuring inside of these thrusters, we have, densities on the order of, of 10 to the minus 18th to 10 to the minus 16th particles per meter cubed inside of the thruster and then outside in the plume, it's, it's less. But if we put something into our thruster region, into the plume inside of this channel, and, and I've got a model of um, a hull thruster here, it's annular inside of this channel. Here is the picture that you see on the, the, the graphic there is where the um, ionization takes place and the acceleration takes place inside this channel. We can measure in the plume fairly easily and we've done that and lots of people have and we can get performance param parameters and stuff. But we have to make assumptions about what's going on inside of this chamber and, and we can. Uh, we have an idea of how it's performing. I'm measuring thrust from time to time. Um, but efficiency gets a little bit tricky so we, we do a lot of assuming. If we can measure what's going on inside of there we would have a better idea of how it's accelerating, how it's ionizing and then we would have a better idea of how we're going to better make this thing and the the real focus is once we figure out the, how that works is being able to tune the electric and magnetic field so we can protect our thruster, magnetically shield it, which is being worked on. And um, 
increase the acceleration of our particles and reduce the losses. One of the losses is doubly ionized and triply ionized. If we can orient our thrusters so the, um, the only particles coming out are singly ionized particles and the energy that we put into this thruster is much more efficient. So, so that's our focus and, and we need to know what's going on inside there, but, but it's difficult inside there trying to measure inside of this thing. Um, same thing for inside of the, the cathode. Inside of the cathode, I'm gonna talk about after that. I'm gonna bring this up here now first. The cathode that we have here, we make ourselves. It's based on the Golden Cats design from JPL. It has an insert inside of it. Small quarter inch kind of insert special material. This one is cerium hexaboride. We use lanthan hexaboride and sometimes we'll use tungsten impregnated with some trace amounts of alumina barrier. We have to heat this thing up to about 1900 degrees Kelvin to make it work. We have to get it to a thermionic emission kind of thing. And, and if we put anything inside of our cathode here inside of this guy at those temperatures, we're definitely gonna melt whatever it is. So we can't put intrusive probes in there for sure. But um, so we're looking at ways that we can measure inside there with intrusive probes and our non-intrusive probes that we have available that we're trying to develop here and, and make and get access to. And come back to that. Let me let me talk a bit more about inside of this channel first. Inside this channel, if we could get down inside there, we would be able to measure things like electron energy distribution, uh, how the energy is being moved around from state to state, and and that's important because of the ionization. That's how things happen inside of our thruster. One and two of the acceleration. Those are the two major physical um, mechanisms going on in there that we want to be able to understand and control if we can. So our goal is to provide engineering quantities for temperature, pressure, velocities, and species concentrations. And this last one gets a little tricky. Um, you can't do that with intrusive probes. If you put something in there, at best, you're gonna be able to measure temperatures, pressures, maybe voltages, but you're not gonna be able to measure differences in species concentrations. Typically, we use xenon. Um, not everybody does. Um, so, um, Starlink and SpaceX use Krypton, and that's a total business decision. Krypton costs about one sixth what Xenon does, and they want to put up 12,000 satellites. So hmm, Krypton is probably their better choice, but Xenon has better performance, uh, has higher mass, uh, and it's storable as a non cryogenic. All right, so this is the thruster we have in our lab. This guy here, we built this one based on a CSU design. And here is inside our channel. And these are the, the relative dimensions that we're talking about for this channel inside there. I want to take us down inside there. First, I want to mention that in the past, we've done some of these intrusive probe type measurements and we've published some of the stuff about the different propellants that we've used. And, and we're looking at using xenon and then eventually iodine as an alternative. So in this graph, you can see how we've taken a couple intrusive probes, an ESA and an E-CROSS-B electrostatic analyzer and a magnetic field probe not a not a wean probe, a E cross B probe. And we've measured the difference, different species in the plume and the uh, charge states. So we can get singly charged and doubly charged with this instrument, and we can get differences in math, mass. So I can tell the difference between my ion peak and my xenon peak, even though those guys are only one neutron apart. So I can I can find all that stuff. The really interesting one is this I2 plus peak down here. We have a very massive particle with a single charge. That would increase our um, our thrust density incredibly, two times what we get with xenon. All right, let's see. Our intrusive probes, though, are somewhat limited. And to get down inside there, what we've done is that we've gone to lasers. Laser diagnostics inside of thrusters is, is hasn't really been done much, but we do it a lot in the plume. We do laser-induced fluorescence, and, and we can focus on very specific species. So I can focus on the I plus in my plume or in my chamber, or I can focus on the I2 plus by picking a different um, line that I am um, exciting and pumping to get this induced fluorescence that I'm trying to measure. The one that we're using is in the um, near infrared and the fluorescence comes out in the green, the 541. So it's pretty easy for us to measure. Instruments are fairly available, but we have to use photomultiplier tubes because the signal strength is, is at the photon level sometimes. But we can do that. And, and when we get these photons, there's a couple different things we can do with them. Um, we want to, let me see. Inside the plume here, we can measure the 
temperature of these species using the laser induced fluorescence and sweeping through the frequency that will give us uh, a curve, a shape that we can then correlate with known um, curves for these things. When we talk about them, we go to the NIST or somebody else's research and, and we can see how the, 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 the line shape changes with temperature. It's a, it's a thermometer. It's an easy way for us to be able to tell the temperature of our plasma. And, and it's very specific oriented because of the induced fluorescence part of it. We're picking specific lines for ion plus, and we can also get then separately temperature for the neutrals and separately temperature for the I, um, I2 plus. And, and I say in iodine, but we're using xenon more than we are iodine right now, but, but back and forth. This is iodine and it's our propellant here. If we go inside the chamber then, and we make those same measurements, um, we can convert them to several different things. And one of the things we want to convert it to of course, is electric field and velocity distribution. The velocity distribution we get by using the induced fluorescence and a reference cell and the Doppler shift between the two. Pretty basic, straightforward approach that people use all the time to get velocity. We have a reference that's not moving and we have a reference that is moving. We measure the difference in the, the response in our, our sample, our excited ions in the, in the plume, and we measure that. So we get this response back, we get a Doppler shift, and we can convert that then into velocities. And the ion velocities coming out of ion thrusters are typically in the order of tens of the, um, kilometers per second. You can see we've got that here. We end up getting closer up to close to 12 just as we get into the plume. This graph shows inside the channel and minus one is at the anode and zero is at the exit plane of the thruster. So exit plane of the thruster is here and the anode in the bottom of the channel is at minus one. All right, so inside the thruster, uh, we, what we've done is we've cut a hole in through our uh, thruster, the one that we have in the lab, and then we put a window in the side so we can see our laser-induced fluorescence. The laser goes through the plasma inside of here, and then we can measure at different locations along the, uh, along the plume, giving us the laser-induced fluorescence and we convert that then with the Doppler shift to velocities the velocity starts to increase right here at the exit plane. And that's kind of how it's designed. Hall effect thrusters want the ionization to happen in the smallest possible region as possible so that the acceleration is all fairly uniform, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. And even in this curve, you can see over the last 20% of the channel is where the acceleration is taking place and even out into the plume. So about 20% out into the plume is still being accelerated by the electric field. The electric field comes from the anode at the bottom, about 250 volts out to the cathode out in the plume that's producing the electrons at about 20 volts. I will have this cathode on the outside producing the electrons and I have a whole big bunch of electrons being attracted by the magnetic field and then trapped in a hall current around the uh, exit plane. That's what's causing the ionization. Some, and then the rest of the electrons coming out of my cathode are going into my plume to neutralize the plume so it doesn't come back to my spacecraft. Um, but we're focused on the inside right here, where the electrons are, how we can trap those electrons, and how those electrons then are producing ionization. And, and as you get into the plume, you start seeing binary things because of some of the geometry in this thruster being uh, coaxial. So we also want to take a look at the electric field and be able to back that off. So we tried to do that with voltage, with uh, velocity, converting it to energy, and then uh, converting that to voltage, and uh, and and it doesn't turn out as well as we'd like. So we go back to our intrusive probes, and we'll actually put a Langmuir probe inside of here, and and either come in from the side or straight in, which it doesn't necessarily give us the best answer. But a wire in the plume uh, changes the plume, but gives us at least the voltage of the plasma in that region. If we do it quickly enough, the wire, the wire doesn't melt. <laughs> we don't disturb the plasma too much. We have to take a whole big bunch of tests to, to come up with something that we can call defendable and realistic about what, what's going on inside of this. And, and we have. We've got these voltages that we can get from um, direct measurements inside of the plume. This is direct voltage measurements and the plasma potential is what we call it. The plasma potential starts out about where we are at the anode. And for this one, operating condition was about 180 volts on the anode. We measured it a whole bunch of ones to see what the differences in the performance were. And in that same region, about minus 20%, uh, we see that the voltage is changing just the same as what we were seeing with the velocities increasing. So we know that the ionization is occurring mostly in this region and the acceleration then is happening uh, immediately right after 
um, getting it to lose. Um, the reason that the voltage potential drops off so much is because now the plasma is participating in the electric field. The plasma and the motion of the plasma actually cause their own induced electric field. So the plasma potential drops from the anode potential all the way down to the cathode potential out in the plume. The first derivative of this plasma potential is what we call the electric field, the E field. And the E field is what we see in the Lorentz force equation, so force. This is how we determine the exchange of momentum. In this thruster, we have an E field exchange in momentum maximum just after that 20% part heading out of the thruster. And what we see is um, most of the thrust then is being applied to the thruster right there. But, but there's no structure in the channel right there. It's not pushing against the anode. So what is the momentum exchange? What, what is the exchange of momentum then right at that region? Well, the particles are going out and the opposite and equal is actually pushing against the magnetic field. The magnetic field is pushing against the iron and the thruster structure and the magnetic field then is how we then transfer that force, that momentum to our spacecraft. If we can optimize that, improve on that, that's what we're trying to think about, is, then we can improve on how we then transfer that momentum to our spacecraft with less loss. So um, ionization rate was what we were going for in terms of that laser-induced fluorescence and even with the intrusive probes, but the laser-induced fluorescence is very specifically focused on species. And we can look at neutral species and we can look at excited state species, we can look at um, first ionized state species. In this sweep here, where we have laser-induced fluorescence um, um, measurements that we've converted into ionization, we, we, we converted um, photons, counts, numbers of photons that we're getting at these different regions into a rate, and we've made it a relative scale based on um, zero and 2.5, what this maximum value is here. Coming up with actual numbers is a little bit more difficult, but I know that my thruster works at about 98% propellant utilization or efficiency. So I know most of my propellant is ionizing before it goes somewhere else. And I can come up with a number for this upper scale, but, but these, these units right now are just kind of um, scaled so that we can show relative differences in the ionization. We're looking for location where the most is happening in this, in this thruster. And we've got a couple interesting cool things going on in here with the ionization, and it's not frequency, it's it's events per second. It's um, mostly happening between that 20% and 10%. So most of the ionization is inside the channel. So um, before that, and that's kind of what we're hoping, that's kind of what we're expecting. Um, trying to quantify that region though, we, we're gonna have to make a whole big bunch more measurements and to get some more confidence in these and the spatially and uh, and we have a couple like this guy here, not sure if that is real or an artifact, but the data that we've gone through says that, that that's where that's at. So I've got a magnetic field that isn't as uniform as I'd like it to be. And I've got some electrons here at higher energies that are also going around and around in that whole current. So there's a large amount of ionization that happens here. So my efficiency is going crazy then. Um, not doing this what I wanted to. The efficiency would be best if my voltage potential went straight out and then dropped down to my cathode potential and then went on out into the plume. That would mean that every particle that is ionized would be accelerated at the anode potential. And that's just not the case with the hull thrusters. We get that way with the ion thrusters, but not, not the hull thrusters. In the gridded ion thrusters, like this one, this is a three centimeter iodine um, thruster from Busick for CubeSat. And it's a two U, it's a one and a half U. And we're gonna to try to put it inside of a 6U CubeSat, but, but this guy we're, we've been running in the lab, we're trying to run it in the lab to get some, some measurements on rust and uh, performance. This is an RF generated plasma inside of the channel, but, but the way that it extracts the ions is very different than in the whole thruster. Um, so we're able to set the grid potential. And when we set that grid potential, that then is the acceleration for our um, ions. And we typically set it at about a thousand volts, somewhere between a thousand and 2000 volts. So ion velocities are on the order of 30 kilometers per second. Faster than for the whole thruster, but we can only extract so many at a time in an ion thruster. That's the limit. And where the whole thruster does better, we're not limited by the number of ions we can extract. All right, so in the ionization, let's see. Another very important 
area of interest that we have is um, in the cathode. And, and we were doing things outside the cathode and we're doing things with, with alternate propellants, but, but inside the cathode is a very um, dynamic environment. And we would like to know a lot, lot more about it. And people have done a lot of engineering on these things and, and a lot of test to failure kind of uh, tests to come up with optimal orifice-sizing and, and electrics and the right inserts, the right shielding. And, and in this image, you can see this cathode is an assembly and inside of the assembly is a molybdenum tube that's wrapped with this tantalum foil. That's my heat shield. Under the tantalum foil is this heater. And I need that heater to be able to heat up my lanthanum inserts. These lanthanum hexaboride inserts or the cerium need to be up at you know, 1800 degrees Celsius, much, much, very, very high temperatures to even get them started. Once they're started uh, thermionically, then I can turn the heater off and they, are, they, they go into what they call a self-heating mode. The ions inside there are bouncing around and redepositing the energy that's in there onto the surface and generating more electrons. The tip of the cathode here, we have um, the keeper and the keeper extracts then the electrons and keeps the ions from getting out of our cathode. We can draw, this, this, this guy is designed for 20 amps of current. It can go up to significant um, current draws well above what we can do with our power supplies. So this um, cathode gets very hot, goes to a self-heating mode, and, and then we will take off the heater off. If I could remove the heater and I can start this guy without that heater, that's a huge loss that I can just get rid of. With the lanthanum, we not, may not be able to, but maybe with a different insert, like um, um, an electride or a tungsten impregnate, we might be able to go to a, a, electro, a heaterless type operation. And, and we've done some starts that way and we've showed that it works. Now we need to know if it's better than these other ones, these hollow cathode ones where we have a heater and if it's worth the effort to go to do that. Well, about the only way that, that they operate the same, they both give me the current that I need and the electrons for the ionization and for the plume neutralization. The only way I'm gonna be able to come up with the differences is, is determine which one uses less power, steady state, and which one um, operates more efficiently. And, and the only way to do that is to get inside of this thing. And there's a few models out there, people looking inside of cathodes and doing computational things, but, but real solid measurements inside of these things, uh, I, I don't know if they exist anywhere other, otherwise. Uh, we're trying to get inside there. We have two ways to get inside of our cathode. We can go in through the orifice while we're looking at the electron cloud coming through. And what we see when we look through there is this big volume of, of plasma. And looking in there with um, uh, infrared camera, we can get things like plasma temperature, average values and stuff like that. And we can get some direct spectral measurements, but we need a, we're gonna have to come up with a better spectrometer to do that, but we can come up with some very good spectral measurements and, and get at least some relative species concentration uh, densities inside there through that hole. Um, we have the window for it, the diamond window that you would need would be infrared transparent to be able to look inside there. This one actually has a tantalum orifice in it right now because tantalum is very resistant to, to the erosion that, that we see with the plasma. So we're in, moving in that direction, but as we move in that direction, we've come up with another plan and we've got an idea. We're going to start by looking in the back end of the thrust of the cathode where the temperatures aren't as extreme and the electronics aren't um, being influenced by the to the voltages and the currents that are being drawn up here. If I put an intrusive probe in here, like a Langmuir probe or a double probe into this end, I will be able to measure plasma properties with that probe. And here's kind of a general schematic of how that would be. I'm gonna take a probe and put it in a box that is sealed to the cathode. So it's all at the same pressure and gas state. And this probe then is going to be able to move in and out of the insert. We're making it very, very small. So we're not just going to the edge of the insert here. We're gonna to try to make measurements all the way up through there. And, and that is definitely gonna disturb the plasma. For us to get reasonable measurements in those regions, um, anything that's not completely disturbed, we're gonna to have to use some sort of actuator, this linear stage that can move at like 300 millimeters per second. Uh, and we've got that set up, it's in the lab, it's all set up, we're getting ready to make some, some tests. That's it in the lab right now. We're getting ready to start the testing actually. Um, really close for that probe to start taking data. Looking forward to the results from that thing. 
And then I want to look forward to changing this insert out and doing it, doing it again with a different insert. So one of the things we looked at, like I said, I mentioned a bunch of times is the iodine propellant. This is the alternative to um, xenon and krypton even. Xenon, krypton, those things are noble gases, very easy for us to store and handle. Iodine gives me the same sort of performance that you get with xenon, but is, is a fraction of the cost of xenon. I can, um, I can put three times the amount of mass in the same volume uh, for iodine as I can xenon. So it has some significant advantages. And one big disadvantage, <laughs> it's highly reactive. So when we run these things in the iodine, like this one here, and this, the, the cathode is running on xenon, but, but this thruster here is a 200 watt hole thruster running on xenon. It comes out really nice and pretty green. That says that we are getting mostly singly ionized I pluses coming out there. So the energy that's being absorbed in the thruster from these electrons is first dissociation, dissociating the iodine, and then it's ionizing the, the particles primarily. That's why we see green. But we sometimes see yellow. <laughs> and when we did some of the cathode testing and we were doing some proof of concept on some of the different cathodes that we've been able to use, we saw both green and yellow. When we get to the higher flow rates, we were trying to see where the limits were for some of these things. We would go up and down in flow, and we'd go up and down in voltages and up and down in current. We'd get different kinds of operating regimes. And one is where you see this yellow. And when you see yellow, that says that you have a much, much different chemical composition in the I2 plus. We can do some direct spectral stuff on this, um, but what I would really like to do is a little bit more um, quantifiable with the laser-induced fluorescence again. And, and the difference between xenon lift and iodine lift is the line that I would pick. So xenon, I use 834, and for iodine, I would use like 699. So a little bit different, but, but the same process, and I've got most of that equipment. So what other problems do I have? Let's see, iodine corrodes the, the, just about everything. It really likes tantalum, which you wouldn't expect um, because tantalum is fairly oxide resistant, but not iodide resistant, apparently. It ate a hole in the side of two of our cathodes while we were doing this proof of concept testing. It's a lot of fun, but now we're down to th two cathodes. <laughs> so um, what materials then do we need to make this work for us really well? We had to set that experiment up too. And, and that's what we've done. We've kind of put it off to the side from the thrusters and we put it in a quartz tube and we've created an inductively coupled plasma where we can operate it with argon, that's the purple, or any gas really, and iodine, the left. We now have, we use RF power source so that we can control the amount of energy, so the plasma density inside of our chamber. And we can control the pressure um, through the mass that we let in in our pumping system. And we can control the temperature. So the temperature of our sample. And we've got this control system set up to do um, sort of a feedback. It, it, it's a full, um, full feedback system to be able to handle the, the changes as we go through temperatures and everything else. The um, plasma, once it's, cup, once it's coupled and, and our electronics are, are doing what they're supposed to match the plasma, then things work pretty smoothly and we can go from one state to the next pretty quickly. It's very reactive though, that's what we found. Iodine propellant is, it, we need to be in temperatures in the 1500 degrees C. Pla iodine at those temperatures are gonna, is gonna be very reactive anyway. Is the iodine plasma going to be more reactive? And that's what we set out to tr try to answer in this test rig. So um, Jim Rogers, one of the research students here, came up with a really good way to, to take a look at how this material interaction was going to happen inside there. Because one of the issues that we had um, that I've had in the past is the, this picture down on the bottom right is the hot anode of that 200 watt hole thruster after we turned it off and using iodine, which says that a whole big bunch of negatively ionized iodine was in the plasma and accelerated toward the anode, causing all of that heat deposited there. After that anode was exposed to air, after about an hour, hour and a half, it looked like the picture on the right. And, and I don't think that uh, somehow it activated the surface and the iron that was in there or preferentially removed all of the other material in the iron alloys, but um, it came out like this and started rusting very quickly. It's not stainless. I think that this is low carbon steel. So it wasn't where um, it wasn't the chrome. It was definitely the iron that was iodizing in the atmosphere after it was highly um, activated by the iodine. So we can't expose our samples to air. 
no matter what, regardless of which one we want, we have to at least expect this to happen with iron. It might be happening with some of the other samples. We have to keep these things in our tube until we are done. And then we have to encapsulate them and take them to the measuring devices, the SEM and the TEM and the shared lab. We started out um, thinking about the different ways that we could do this. We came up, Jim, Jim came up with this really cool resistive type probe where we can put it inside of the inside of the plasma, heat it with a current up to the temperature that we want it to be, and we can set that temperature, measuring the current as it erodes, and as that current and voltage potential change. Over time, we know that the, the material is being eroded away. We can quantify that. We can actually use that as one of our diagnostics. We can quantify how much material is being removed from these probes as it is being removed in the plasma. So it's real time in situ time um, accurate measurements of the erosion rates, tungsten, molybdenum, all of these different ones that we're gonna to try to put in there. So when we take the samples out, like I said, we kind of have to make sure we don't expose them to air and we get them to the electron microscopes as quickly as we can. Scanning the surfaces, we start to see how the surface changes um, on tungsten a little bit, but it mostly looks like it's being polished by the plasma, cleaned really well and smoothed out somewhat. You can see that the tungsten map is, is fairly well uniform. Uh, this dark area might be a, an artifact of, of the electron microscope and, and the way we took that picture, but we don't see anything else in there much, just tungsten mostly in the, uh, in the EDS, the atomic composition on the surface. And tungsten's pretty good and uh, pretty resistant to the iodine, actually. We looked at how um, the iodine itself, we looked at, at several different things, but we looked at how the iodine affected it versus anything else at those temperatures, how the iodine plasma affected it versus other plasmas, and argon plasma was one that we used. And right now we're working on the molybdenum. And molybdenum is one of those um, more common type materials that we'd like to use inside of the thruster since tantalum isn't going to be... Um, possible, just it's, the erosion rates are just too high. This is what the surface looks like after argon plasma exposure to most of our samples. You see the grain structure. Um, there's a little bit of preferential particles removed along the grains, but for the most part, you can see that it looks like um, plasma cleaned surfaces. On the right, we have what we've been calling worms on the surface. We have a lot of different things going on there, and I'm not sure if um, there's some sort of preferential thing going on with the grain, or if we've got some other stuff, stuff going on. This is a very preliminary result right now. We are just at the beginning of looking at these pictures that, that we took just last week. And if you look a little closer at some of these things, you see crystal growth. And, and the thing is, is in this image is a little bit deceiving and the lighting is a little bit off. These canyons inside of the crystals in between the crystals are pretty deep. They go down in there pretty far. So is the crystal growing away from the surface that far or is the iodine plasma removing material preferentially between those crystals? And right now we're still trying to, to figure that out. We've got some more measurements to make and some more diagnostics to put this, this sample in. This I thought was a really cool one too. Another different crystal growth on the surface of our molybdenum and at a different magnification, but you can see a lot of fine structures and a lot of extensive crystal growth on the surface. Are these iodides of tungsten or molly? I'm sorry, this is molybdenum. Are these iodides of molybdenum that are hanging around? Most of the molybdenum iodides have um, vapor temperatures and pressures well below the operating conditions that we're set in yet. So we're expecting just the surface to erode away. But now we have these, these things are not deposits. These are definitely crystal growth on the surface. So I kind of went through uh, those things and um, a little quick, but if you have any questions about any of these slides or um, any of the research going on here at UN University of Alabama, I'd be happy to get back with you or talk to you about it at any other time. I, I should have put my email address in here, but, but um, you can find me easy enough at the University of Alabama. My email address is on the website. Since I do have a couple more minutes and I was worried about running out of time, I wanted to, I jumped past the uh, LIF information and I wanted to I have a couple black up slides. I'm just gonna go ahead and show you a couple things real quick. 
So for the laser induced fluorescence, we can induce a fluorescence on xenon. And like I said, we hit this guy with um, 823 or 834 and we pump it up to a high state and then we watch for the green ions coming off. For iodine, we can do the same thing and we also get a visible response. We can take measurements of the thermographic images of our, our thrusters. And this is kind of cool, it shows where, where the hot spots are, where the erosion rate is gonna be the highest and things like that on our surface. But the laser induced fluorescence diagnostic um, uses a monchrometer, a monchrometer and some other instruments, wave meter to make sure that we are accounting for power fluctuations and temperature fluctuations in the lab and all of those things that you would expect to experience. And, and then when we get there, we measure things like this. And this is our res response in the laser induced fluorescence. This is a raw response of what um, the fluorescence trace would look like. We have two, we have our reference trace in the lamp on the table. And then we have the trace that's in the plume itself where we have um, 10 to 20 kilometers per second. The plasma is moving for, uh, at very high velocities. This simple Doppler shift then is linear related to the velocity of the particles. And we use the velocity, the kinetic theory to convert velocity then to temperatures. This is um, another way for us to, to more accurately determine temperature using the laser induced fluorescence. I mentioned that we want temperature from these things and, and this is how we would do it. We know that the laser response, the, the spectral response from these things on these lines is going to have certain kinds of broadening. Uh, Doppler broadening, St Stark, uh, Zeeman, all these different things going on in there and these physical processes that have been determined over the years by um, other researchers. We know that we have primarily a void profile for these lines when we do this with these with lift. When we scan across the lift lines and we get this fluorescence response, we expect it to look like a void profile, which is the convolution of a Lorenzian profile and a Gaussian profile. The Lorenzian profile is, um, is generated because of the um, residual rate, the how long the, the particles hang around, this time constant here. And the Gaussian one is the Doppler, most of the, the random Martian motion of the particles in our plume. So when we go and measure this thing, we get uh, a Gaussian, we get this Voigt profile that we can fit. We have one variable that we use as we fit this curve, and that's the plasma temperature or the electron temperature of the plasma. When we're looking at that species or that species uh, temperature. So the, um, if we're focused on these singly ionized xenon, then we would have that temperature for that. But the magnetic field and the electric field inside the thruster are um, very impactful in, in what we're trying to do. One of the things we can do in the plume, no problem, we don't have the electric and magnetic field out there to worry about. So we just get the void profile. Inside the thruster though now, we're taking this laser induced fluorescence, we're getting these kinds of curves on the right, where you have a magnetic field and electric field causing extra quantum mechanical splitting at, at the rotational and um, or at the different electron excitation modes, rotational modes. For um, any amount of xenon, you have a certain amount that has even number of particles in the nucleus, and then there's some in there naturally that have odd numbers. So I have xenon-129 and xenon-131 uh, have significant part, a number of particles in my xenon. When I take that measurement under very strong electric and magnetic fields, the curl on the right is what you see. The response is what I get. I get this extra splitting where this one peak actually is not one peak anymore. It has this very distinctive shape. And, and I'm not sure I have the resolution I need to be able to resolve all of that, but we are taking these measurements now inside that electric and magnetic field. And we are seeing this, this influence as well. We have to take into account. Okay, I'm gonna stop there then. I think um, if there are any further questions or um, anything else that you might need for me, feel free to. All right. Thank you so much, Rich, um, for joining us today and giving us a very interesting talk. If anybody has any question, please put them in the comments below on YouTube, and I'll make sure to send them to, um, to Rich, and he can answer those for you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day.